uh, as chairman of this committee to bring an assault weapons ban to the House floor. And I'm proud uh, that today we are moving forward to pass H.R. 1808 uh, and ban assault weapons, or I should say reinstate the assault weapons ban. Uh, we're, we're meeting with urgency because gun violence is destroying communities, tearing apart families, and making our streets less, less safe. And we need, we need to do every single thing we can to stop it. We need to do everything we can to save lives and to stop mass shootings. Uh, I expect to hear a lot of, of, of objections uh, about uh, the process, um, and I get it, but here's the bottom line. We're using the process today to try to save lives. And let's be clear, nothing in this bill is secret. It was introduced in the House over 500 days ago. It's undergone a committee markup, and it's an issue that's been debated for decades and decades. 67% of Americans, including half of all Republicans, support a ban on assault weapons. This is not a radical idea. We're not in uncharted territory. The 1994 assault weapons ban was associated with a 25% drop in gun massacres and a 40% drop in fatalities. The American people want us to act. For decades, that hasn't happened. The gun lobby has an iron grip on this place. But now, finally, that is changing. And it's changing because the American people are demanding change, and we're listening. So earlier this month, Democrats and Republicans came together to pass the Safer Communities Act, the first piece of major gun safety legislation in decades, which President Biden has now signed into law. Today, we are building on that important progress by getting deadly weapons of war off our streets. And I'm asking my Republican colleagues, please uh, do not throw away this opportunity to get something done. This is not an extreme idea. Uh, or an attack on the Second Amendment, uh, our Second Amendment rights, it is possible to support the Second Amendment and also believe that there are limits to the Second Amendment. Those ideas are not mutually exclusive. Don't listen to those who are spreading conspiracy theories saying that this is going to lead to everyone's guns being taken away. That's just not true. Uh, nothing in this bill is aimed at taking firearms away from law-abiding gun owners. It is aimed at preventing our constituents from getting slaughtered in their schools, their churches, their grocery stores, and their homes. We have an obligation to act with urgency, and we have an, a responsibility to address this crisis. With that, I turn to my good friend, Mr. Cole, for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You will be surprised to uh, learn that we see this somewhat differently. Our fourth hearing of the week covers a deeply partisan bill, H.R. 1808, the Assault Weapons Ban of 2022. This bill constitutes the greatest attack on the constitutional rights of law-abiding gun owners that I've seen during my time in, here in Congress. Again and again, this Congress, uh, we've watched the majority try to reduce or eliminate the rights of American citizens to purchase or own firearms. Today's measure is a direct attack on that right. Rather than protecting the rights enshrined in the Second Amendment, H.R. 1808 would ban a broad group of firearms, including some of the most popular firearms on the market today. This is a direct infringement of the Second Amendment, one that is certainly unconstitutional and one that I cannot and will not support. I will not vote to take away the right to bear arms from 99.9% .9 of gun owners who are law-abiding citizens. But more importantly, the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution does not allow Congress to take away that right. And for all the majority's righteous talk in recent weeks about respecting supposedly settled rights in the Constitution, they certainly are only too happy to trample on one of them when it suits them politically. I believe this bill is deeply misguided. I have been clear that I believe that any effort to address gun violence must be deliberate and open and must ensure that the constitutional rights are preserved for all Americans. Sadly, this measure does not meet that test. It is also clear that this bill will not pass the Senate and will not become law. The majority certainly is aware of that fact. But once again, we're here on a deeply partisan, deeply divisive, and ultimately pointless messaging exercise. I must once again remind the majority that they need to decide if they are here to make political points or here to make law. Again and again and again, this committee is asked to take up bills like this one, bills that are very clearly only designed to make political points and that cannot become law. This practice is deeply frustrating. And it's uh, not good for the institution or for the nation. I hope this practice changes and changes quickly. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I'd now um, like to welcome our witnesses to provide testimony in H.R. 1808, the assault weapons ban. Uh, Chairman Nadler, Representative Massey, we're delighted uh, that you are here. I now recognize the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Na Chairman Nadler.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of H.R. 1808, the Assault Weapons Ban of 2022. As we have learned all too well in recent years, assault weapons, especially when combined with high-capacity magazines, are the weapon of choice for mass shootings. These military-style weapons are designed to kill the most people in the shortest amount of time. Today, I am pleased to bring forward a bill that restores and updates the prior assault weapons ban that kept weapons of war out of our communities for a decade before Republicans opposed its renewal. H.R. 1808, the assault weapons ban of 2022, introduced by Re Representative David Cicilline, prohibits the sale, manufacture, transfer, or possession of semi-automatic assault weapons and large capacity ammunition feeding devices, subject to grandfathering provisions and other exceptions. At the same time, the bill grandfathers existing semi-automatic assault weapons and contains numerous protections for law enforcement and responsible gun owners, including hunters, gun collectors, farmers, sport shooters, and those who use firearms for self-defense. The bill recognizes that there are many Americans who already own assault weapons and large capacity magazines. Therefore, H.R. 1808 allows for the continued possession of any semi-automatic assault weapon lawfully possessed on the date of enactment, and the sale or transfer of any semi-automatic assault weapon lawfully possessed on the date of enactment following a background check. H.R. 1808 also contains many protections for responsible gun owners, hunters, collectors, farmers, sport shooters, law enforcement, and those who use firearms for self-defense through exemptions. It also allows for temporary transfers without a background check to target shooting at a licensed target facility established range. Finally, the bill allows states to use burn justice assistance grant funds for voluntary buyback programs for semi-automatic assault weapons and large capacity magazines. It is no surprise that assault weapons are the weapon of choice for mass shooters and those who target law enforcement. They are designed for ruthless efficiency, killing the most people in the shortest amount of time. The Assault Weapons Ban Act that we are considering today who take these weapons of war off our streets, make a meaningful difference, and save countless lives. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Massey. It's good to see you again. The floor is yours. Good to see you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for allowing me to testify about this bill. Uh, we find ourselves here again this summer discussing the Democrats' obsession with disarming law-abiding Americans. We all agree that we should be working together to make our communities safer. However, we can't keep people safe by limiting law-abiding citizens' right to self-defense and restricting Americans' constitutional rights. At the beginning of the summer, the House considered H.R. 2377, the Federal Extreme Risk Protection Order. At that time, many Republicans pointed out that the bill violated constitutional due process rights set out in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments by depriving citizens of their property and rights without having been charged, arraigned, or convicted of any crime. At that time, we also considered H.R. 7910, a grab bag of radical Democrat proposals that would restrict American Second Amendment rights without any evidence that it would make anything better. In fact, with, within, there's some evidence that it would make it worse. For instance, uh, there was a new definition of gun trafficking in that bill, that, which would apply even to victims of domestic violence who acquired a firearm from their neighbor for protection that person would be considered a gun trafficker under that bill that passed this House. A few weeks later, we considered the so-called Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. This, that bill was just the Senate version of a grab bag of gun restriction proposals that wasn't any better than the House version we considered just a couple of weeks earlier. In fact, I would argue it also contained another provision that's very dangerous to most gun owners in this country, it redefined gun dealer or unlicensed for the purposes of convicting unlicensed gun dealers to include virtually anybody who sells a gun for a profit. They wouldn't, you could sell one gun. There was no limitation on the number of guns you had to sell. And uh, I think that's prob uh, problematic. Over the past few months, we've seen the Democrats approach to semi-automatic firearms become more and more radical. First, they wanted to raise the age of just about everyone to buy certain semi-automatic firearms. Then they wanted those of a certain age to undergo enhanced background checks. Now Democrats want to ban them for all law-abiding Americans. 
Those, those guns that they wanted to raise the age for just a few weeks ago, now they're just saying, let's ban all of them. Why can't they make up their minds? The answer is simple, really. They want to limit American Second Amendment rights as much as possible, and they really don't care what the Constitution says. H.R. 1808, the so-called assault weapon ban of 2022, would ban some of the most popular firearms in use today. In fact, the most popular rifle sold today is the target of this legislation. According to some estimates, there are more than 24 million firearms, like the ones Democrats want to ban, in circulation today. In District of Columbia v. Heller, the Supreme Court made clear that the Second Amendment protects firearms in common use at the time for lawful purposes like self-defense. There's no doubt that the bans in H.R. 1808 concern firearms in the common use. In fact, it is the Democrats' stated goal in our Judiciary Committee to ban commonly used weapons. During the Judiciary Committee's markup on H.R. 1808, Representative Bishop from North Carolina asked Chairman Nadler if it is the point of this bill to ban weapons that are in common use in the United States today, to which Chairman Nadler replied, the problem is they are in common use. Well, there's just one problem with that. Uh, the courts are correctly applying the Constitution. Just last week, less than 48 hours after the Judiciary committed, Committee voted to report out H.R. 1808, a federal district court judge in Colorado who was appointed by President Obama issued a temporary restraining order against the town of Superior, Colorado to prevent it from implementing an assault weapon ban. The judge wrote, quote, plaintiffs have stated that semi-automatic weapons as well as magazines that hold more than 10 rounds are commonly used by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. The court is sympathetic to the town's stated reasoning. He continued, however, the court is unaware of historical precedent that would permit a governmental entity in, to entirely ban a type of weapon that is commonly used by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes, whether in, in an individual's home or in public. There you have it, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee. You are moving forward with a piece of legislation that will very likely be found constitutional if it does pass the Senate and get signed by the President. In H.R. 1808, Democrats are trying to legislate away American Second Amendment liberties I urge an open rule on this deeply flawed bill and very, very likely unconstitutional bill, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to ask, uh, without uh, objection, in terms of the record, a statement of administration policy uh, in uh, support of H.R. 1808. Uh, Mr. Cole. Uh, Mr. Massey, for a guy that I know only likes to come here once every three years, whether you need to or not, we've seen a lot of you. <laughs> and. Uh, I appreciate, frankly, the, the uh, insight you've brought to this committee. So I've got a series of questions for you. What's the uh, difference between a selective fire gun and a semi-automatic gun? Well, uh, a semi-automatic gun requires a pull of the trigger to discharge a bullet. And a single pull of the trigger discharges one single bullet. Uh, a select fire is called select fire because you can select oftentimes from safe, semi-automatic, and fully automatic. And so a, a fully automatic firearm is defined, and I think this is the proper definition, by the way, of, as uh, any firearm where you pull the trigger and you discharge more than one round with a single pull of the trigger. Is it true that selective fire guns, are, as you describe, are already illegal in the United States? Is that correct? The uh, select fire firearms, and that is to say those that have fully automatic capability, were banned in 1986 by this body McClure-Volmer Act, it was signed by uh, President Reagan in the spring of 1986 and became effective, and there have been no uh, fully automatic firearms manufactured for civilian use since that time. Um, the ones that were in circulation require extreme background checks, FBI, ATF, fingerprints, local law enforcement, and are not used and haven't been used in the commission of a crime. And can you briefly describe the type of weapons this bill would ban and uh, what legal uses they have? Well, let me start with the legal uses. Uh, millions of gun owners use these legally every week. Uh, my children and I hunt with these types of firearms. The AR-15 platform, it seems to be the target of this legislation. And um, it shoots a 223 round, and that's what I prefer 
when I'm hunting with my boys, they prefer that because it has less of a recoil. Unfortunately, it has less of a, a deadly effect than the uh, most deer rounds that are used. So there's some irony in this bill that they're seeking to ban weapons that have less capacity to do harm than other weapons. So um, this bill would also ban similar designs to the AR-15, like the AR-10, which shoots a 308 round, also known as 762, and um, is, is, a, is a more powerful cartridge, but not, still not nearly as powerful as the weapon they don't ban in this bill, which is the M1 Garand. Now, I find this very interesting. To quote General George Patton, he said, the M1 Garand is the finest implement of war ever devised. And uh, that's because it shoots a 30 out 6 round, which is more powerful than the 308 round that I described that, this, uh, that would be fired in the weapons that are banned by this bill. So I find it somewhat ironic that the, the claim, and you'll hear this later today on the floor debate, if you so choose to allow this rule to go through, you'll hear this later that the, the 223 is so deadly of a round, but and that they are banning weapons of war, when in reality they're not banning weapons of war like the M1 carbine, the M1 Garand, or even the SKS. The Democrats refer to this uh, as an assault weapons ban, but really this bill would ban a wide variety of semi-automatic rifles and other small arms that are similar in shape, color, general appearance to an actual assault weapon. Is that correct? That is correct. I looked up uh, what was the most popular selling rifle in 2019, 2020, 2021. It turns out it's, uh, it's a Ruger 1022, but the second most popular rifle is an AR-15 by another, by a certain brand, and the third most popular is an AR-15 by another brand, and the fourth most popular is an AR-15 by another brand. And as it turns out, if you're just counting the platform and not the brand, the AR-15 is the most popular rifle being sold today and has been for several years in a row. And what does the data tell us about the effectiveness of banning semi-automatic weapons? Well, I think, you're, yeah, I think you're going to hear a lot of falsehoods in the debate here today that the 94 to 2004 assault weapons ban was effective uh, at reducing crime. The reality is I have, I have the manufacturer's data for these types of weapons that this bill seeks to ban and that the uh, 94 to 2004 ban sought to ban. And it turns out that uh, there were hundreds of thousands of these weapons made every year from 94 to 2004. There were over 2 million of these so-called assault weapons style weapons. The Democrats call them assault weapons. I would maintain they are not assault weapons, but they were Two million of these that came into circulation during the ban. So if the Democrats will argue today that crime went down from 94 to 2004 and it had anything to do with the types of weapons they seek to ban, they're going to have to concede that the number of these weapons doubled during that period of time. That before uh, 1994, for instance, in 1990, if you look at the types of AR and AK that would be the AK-47 type weapon, not the fully automatic. But um, there were 74,000 of those either made or imported into the United States in 1990. But in um, 2003, there were 380,000 of those made or imported into the United States. Now, they, you know, they want to renew this ban, but it's a cosmetic ban in large part, and what and what we found from 94 to 2004 is 2 million of these firearms came into existence and none of the old ones went out of existence. And under current law, are states already able to ban semi-automatic weapons? Um, the, from the, I think that is problematic if, it's, if we use the test that the Supreme Court used in Heller and uh, based on the court case that I stated earlier, uh, in Colorado, a judge has ruled that if it's in common use, uh, which was the test that the Supreme Court uses, that they could not. Okay, and uh, last question, uh, and you've touched on this in your testimony, but 
in, in many ways, in my opinion, H.R. 1808 has more to do with the perception of safety than actual public safety. Can you speak to why <clears throat> policies that advance the perception of safety are damaging to act the actual public safety efforts? Well, I think it's dangerous because once this bill passes, people will think that they're safer. But the reality is that this bill, as written, unless it is greatly amended, bans firearms based on aesthetics and, and not based on their lethality. And um, a lot of the guns banned in here, it's, it feels like they're banned because they are <coughs> they're black plastic. They have blast, black plastic accessories. Guns which are not banned in here, which, for instance, have been used in shootings. By the way, any gun can be used by somebody who wishes to commit harm. Even the most basic gun, a shotgun, that fires multiple projectiles with a single pull of the trigger. One, one round, but multiple projectiles is, is in many ways more lethal than what the, within 20 yards, which is where most of these shootings occur. They don't happen at long distances, is more lethal than the, the guns that are uh, sought to be banned here. And that's why gun owners are suspicious. If, if this bill purports to make Americans safer by banning these guns, which have certain characteristics and lethality, then the American gun owners know that when this bill doesn't work, the Democrats will come back and seek to ban other guns that, in fact, in practice, have more lethality, like a 30 6 deer rifle or a 12-gauge shotgun, a uh, pump shotgun, which are not banned in here. And um, again, just to name a few of the actual military weapons, the, the quintessential Cold War Chinese uh, Communist Party weapon, the SKS, is not banned in here. Um, why is that? Maybe because it's got wood furniture. Maybe because it's not got black plastic. It doesn't look modern. But the issue is it, it shoots a caliber uh, with a charge behind it that's just as lethal, if not more lethal, than many of the guns banned here. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Nadler, I assume you believe in the right of self-defense. Um, if so, under what conditions, what type of weapon would be appropriate? Well, uh, any, any, any self-defense where you, where you perceive a threat from some, some individual, a group of individuals, obviously, you're entitled to defend. And, uh, any non-military weapon, unlike the military-type uh, weapons that we're talking about here. Um, I represent uh, some parts of rural Oklahoma, and many of my constituents honestly live quite a distance away from the nearest police station. In a situation where dangerous animals or an intruder is threatening the life of people in that kind of situation, how would you recommend they respond? Well, there are more than 2,000 guns to choose from that would not be banned by this bill. As you know, criminals don't follow the law, so if a criminal has a semi-automatic weapon and my law-abiding constituent doesn't, what happens in a scenario like that? Well, you wouldn't advocate that since criminals don't follow the law, we shouldn't have any laws. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry that... There's a technical. I said you wouldn't advocate that since, I assume you wouldn't advocate that since criminals don't follow the law, we shouldn't have any laws. That's not and what I suggested. I just think in a situation like that, you've got an obvious mismatch. But anyway, uh, one or two more. More than half the gun crimes committed uh, in the country with a handgun, or committed with a handgun, not a semi-automatic rifle. Would you support a handgun ban? We only ban uh, high-capacity clips if they're inserted into a handgun. Yeah, but would you a support that? A normal handgun is not banned. A normal handgun is not banned by this, by this bill. I didn't suggest it was. I'm just curious, would you support a ban of handguns? No. Thank you very much. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for that delay. Um, we are here today yet again 
um, to take up common sense gun violence legislation in response to multiple mass shootings across the country. Earlier this week, I held a telephone town hall for my constituents on this very important issue. I heard from my constituents on the need for additional action on gun violence prevention. Unfortunately, my constituents know all too well the devastation and heartbreak of gun violence in our community. In 2015, the Inland Empire in California was the victim of a mass shooting. 14 people were viciously murdered. Two of them were my constituents. This happened at the Inland Regional Center. The Inland Regional Center is a place where people with disabilities go for care. Assault rifles and semi-automatic handguns were used in that mass shooting against very vulnerable people. Just this year, we saw the horror unfold in Uvalde, Texas where 21 people, 19 of them children, and two teachers were brutally murdered while learning their ABCs. DNA samples had to be collected from their families in order to identify the bodies. That's the type of weapon that we are talking about today. It is deeply disturbing to recognize that this event was the second deadliest K-12 through school shooting on record in the second mass shooting in just a 10 day span. After the shooting at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, which killed 10 people. Since Uvalde, there have been more than 30 mass shootings. You know, before I served the Inland Empire in Congress, I was a 911 dispatcher for 17 and a half years. I've been on the other end of the phone line, talking, taking difficult, calls. Many of them were situations of gun violence. Hearing gunfire while talking to a child is something that I will never forget. That horrific popping sound is usually followed by a desperate voice on the other end, screaming in pain or complete silence. I know exactly what the price is for congressional inaction on banning assault weapons. That inaction will cost us more dead children, more trauma to our families, first responders, and medical personnel who struggle to fix the wounds and stop the bleeding afterwards. I am disgusted that we cannot come together to help innocent people go about their daily lives without fearing that some crazy person will come after them while they're in church, shopping, at a concert, or learning their ABCs. The Second Amendment gives citizens the right to own a firearm. A firearm. Absolutely, it does. But it does not specify the type of weapon that could be allowed. That was left open purposely to give legislators an opportunity to make life-saving common sense accommodations. We live in a modern society where dangerous individuals are getting their hands on these dangerous weapons, where gun manufacturers have refused to adopt basic safety mechanisms that could prevent these weapons from being fired by anyone other than the owner. They have also continued to target the sales of these weapons to children and religious people. After nearly three decades, Congress finally passed bipartisan legislation last month, but it was too late, too late and more must be done for the families who have lost loved ones to gun violence. These bills before us today will help prevent more catastrophes from happening in our communities. When is enough going to be enough? Much more blood must be shed in our communities before Republicans provide a, some type of protection to our community. Stop hiding behind the Second Amendment and do your job. We can't sit by over and over again and make no changes while our children are being murdered. 
I urge everyone to take a sensible look at this. Put aside the profits of your major donors because our communities need this. The American people are expecting that you to protect them. I urge you to support this bill today, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Dr. Burgess. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I, I regret the fact that in the process by which we were brought here today, uh, um, I do appreciate the fact that I was at least allowed to stand for the national anthem last night at the ballpark before having to sign on to our emergency hearing to allow the rules to proceed on the floor today. But, um, Mr. Massey, so good to see you again. Uh, we always learn so much when you come to our, our rules committee. Um, now, the statement was made that this bill that we have in front of us today was, has in fact been in the Committee on the Judiciary for some time and has been marked up in some form or other at, during, the, during its tenure. I, I guess I'm intrigued by the fact that uh, starting at page 25, Appendix A, and then extending to page, I don't know, 121, are the firearms exempted by the assault weapons ban of 2022? It seems like a pretty lengthy list. In committee, did you go through each one of those and, and render a decision? No, and I find this list very curious because um, it includes rifles like bolt action rifles and, and pump rifles that if you just take the plain reading of the beginning of the bill, you would think you wouldn't need to exempt these rifles. That uh, they, I didn't think that any of these rifles listed in, the, in that long appendix that you showed would or should have been banned by the text of the beginning of the bill, which makes me wonder why such a long list. Is well, and you know, I will admit, you piqued my curiosity about what makes gun owners suspicious about this activity is what is what is next. Is it merely an amendment to the bill to remove half of the exempted firearms from the appendix? I, I think uh, maybe they're trying to condition us for having a list of guns that you can own instead of uh, a list of guns that you can't, which I think is very dangerous to, to go down that path. Yeah, I, and, and I agree with you. And that's, I guess that's that potential proscriptive activity that, um, look, um, <clears throat> by the way, I, I saw some conflicts, by the way, in the list yes. with, with the beginning list. So with the, and, and this came out, and maybe they seek to fix this in their bill before it gets debated today, but the Ruger Mini 14, and it's uh, a tactical form, right, is banned in the beginning of the bill. The receiver is banned in the beginning of the bill. And then in the exempted list is a different version of the Mini 14, which is not banned. And there's no, uh, th then that puts the receiver of the not banned gun in an ambiguous condition legally because the receiver of the banned gun and the receiver of the not banned gun are identical receivers. And they have explicitly banned receivers of banned guns. So uh, maybe, I mean, this thing was rushed through committee. They, I uh, pointed that out to them in committee. Maybe they're going to try and fix that in a manager's amendment. I'm not sure, but that's just one example. I can't go through every... There's dozens of guns on here. It's hard to find all of the conflicts. Yes. I found in their list also uh, a, a, a rifle. Actually, I asked my brother, said, is your rifle banned? And he goes and he looks for it in the list. And he says, well, it looks like it's in the exempt list, but they call my 44 Magnum a rimfire rifle. And uh, he's like, if somebody offers to let you shoot a rimfire 44 Magnum, you need to run. Like, that is not the right cartridge. That, is, that cartridge doesn't exist. So there were also some problems in this list that just by mere sampling by one person, like check this gun, see if it's in there, it, it was described improperly in the list of things that aren't banned. So that gives me concern that this is rushed through and that the people rushing it through don't really understand the, the uh, technical aspects of the things they're trying to ban. We appreciate you sharing the in-depth uh, polling and study that you did by consulting your brother. <laughs> yeah. He knows more than me about guns. <laughs> yeah.
that's uh, scary. Um, <laughs> let me, uh, let me, we've talked about this before when you've been up here at other times. Uh, look, we've done or attempted a number of things on, on gun, affecting gun ownership uh, from a previous Congress, from previous legislation, and I think it was the fix mix bill. Um, one of my concerns was it was never a requirement for the Department of Justice to provide us a list of people who had falsified information on their application and they were never prosecuted, that, that the number of actual detected falsifications is large, the number of prosecutions is minuscule. Um, in committee, have you all done anything to address that? Yeah, to that point, the last year that we have data for, there were 112,000 denials in the instant background check system, which a lot of people put a lot of faith in. But time and time again, we see that it's failed to keep people from purchasing firearms that then go on to commit crime. But the question is, if 112,000 people failed the test, how many were of those were convicted? Because ostensibly, the way you fail that test is you're a prohibited person and you check all the boxes that say you are not a prohibited person. And then you attest with the signature that you are not a prohibited person and you have perjured yourself on this form. And so 112,000 of those, if they're not overturned, a few of them got overturned and they did get there initially, but most of them weren't. There were only 12 prosecutions out of over 100,000 denials. What is going on here? Why do we not have the data? Why, is, why are federal prosecutors not prosecuting people for the crime of being a prohibited person, lying about it, and trying to purchase a firearm? Which is, which is to me, what is so disturbing, the statement of administration policy, which I haven't had the, uh, hasn't been provided, so I haven't read it, but you have an administration that is barely, it's not just this administration, it was a previous Previous administration, the one before that, where, where all of these non-prosecutions occurred. So when is the administration going to come to us with a commitment that we're actually going to follow through on this and we're going to take, we're going to take these activities seriously? It doesn't seem like they're serious. We are almost being told we, we have to legislate because the problem is so severe, but they're never going to enforce the law. So it, as a practical matter, it doesn't matter, and we might as well leave people's Second Amendment rights alone. Yeah, and, and here's the thing. I think one of the reasons they don't want to go after convictions of those 112,000 denials is they know there's some false denials in there. And at the end of the day, the, according, they don't care if it's a law-abiding gun owner just trying to execute his or her constitutional rights. They just want fewer people to have guns. And so if we've got a system that's leaky, it misses people, it, but if it's biased in terms of like pre-convicting people and denying them their Second Amendment rights, if it's overly restrictive, oh, that's okay, don't worry about it. The problem is when you blur your eyes and don't care about accuracy, you're also missing some of the others. And we've seen that happen. Yes, we have, haven't we? Well, uh, thank you for your participation once again. I, uh, Happy to yield back to the chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. I'll just make a quick statement. Mr. Massey, I got to tell you, your uh, encyclopedic uh, knowledge of this area of firearms is really impressive. But for me, it misses the mark clearly. Because I think as legislators, our first responsibility really comes in the preamble to the Constitution of a more perfect union, establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility, providing for the common defense, and promoting the general welfare. And when we have slaughters, as we've had in Buffalo shoppers, Uvalde students, little kids, uh, Highland Park, parade watchers, Aurora, Colorado, movie goers, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, people going to the synagogue, Littleton, Colorado, high schoolers. All of that stuff that you talk about, all of the different kinds of ramifications and details of each gun and what trigger and all that stuff, it completely misses the mark of the slaughter that is going on. And it is, our, I, in my opinion, our number one responsibility. And as much as I appreciate how much you know about this, these types of weapons and the different triggers and 
and barrels and, you know, uh, what the recoil is and all of that stuff. And I, I, honestly, it is impressive. It misses the mark. And I am support of the rule. I'm going to support this bill. There have just been too many mass deaths. And so with that, I yield back to the chair. Uh, Mr. Reschethaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Just to pick up where Mr. Perlmutter left off, I actually think your encyclopedic knowledge, uh, I, I, I think that's spot on. The reason it's spot on is because it's reinforcing your point that this legislation is just aimed at reducing the amount of guns that citizens can own legally without regard to the specifications and capability of different platforms. Would you like to expand upon that? Well, I think it is if we're going to legislate and if you are going to try and balance restricting the rights of the individual and, and society, you need to be precise. And I think it does matter. And I, uh, I, I do believe we've probably some of this language is going to get changed because I'm torn. I mean, I have lended what I know about guns to the debate, and it looks like they're getting better at writing gun banning legislation, uh, but still making huge mistakes. And the, what the mistakes that happen is uh, you end up accidentally banning things you didn't mean to, and increasing the constituency of people who will be opposed to this. this so just a, as an example, and I don't mean this to try to show off or anything, it's a genuine concern of gun owners about this bill. There's a provision in here that I appreciate, it's very well intended, um, on, uh, it's on page three, line four through eight. It says, the, uh, the bill seeks to ban any part, combination of parts, component, device, attachment, or accessory that is designed or functions to accelerate the rate of fire of a semi-automatic firearm. Well, I, I think I know what you're trying to do. I think you want to ban bump stocks, okay? And maybe some other things that might be out there that people don't know about, but, but you're aware of. But the way it's written could cover somebody who lightens the trigger of their firearm. I mean, there are some firearms which come with the device that makes it easier to pull the trigger to activate the firing of the gun. Now, these aren't used, I don't think, particularly by people who are indiscriminately shooting in, in shopping malls. These are used by competition shooters who would take 30 seconds or a minute to sit there and steady a rifle and acquire a target, or they may be used by women who seek to have a lighter trigger pull because the gun came from the factory with a heavy trigger pull. But you can imagine how having a lighter trigger pull might mean that a woman could fire a gun faster. It's not intended to make it simulate fully automatic fire, but people are asking me, you know, can you offer an amendment to clarify that? And I did in Judiciary Committee. And, and it wouldn't have stopped you from banning bump stocks. Uh, but it would have stopped you from accidentally banning a device or a combination of devices or parts or components that were put in a firearm to allow somebody to be more accurate or a woman to shoot the gun without having to pull so hard that she misses the mark. And on the topic of bump stocks, it's my understanding that last minute administration actually banned bump stocks. Is that... The, the, there is a, an administrative ban on bump stocks, yes. You were talking uh, with Ranking Member Cole about the difference between the AR-15 and the M-16 and the M-4. Uh, when, we, when we're told that these are weapons of war, is that an accurate statement? And I'm saying I'm referring to AR-15s as these. I don't know. I don't believe it's an accurate statement to say that the AR-15 is a weapon of war. It's a sporter rifle. It does not have the selective switch that goes into fully automatic fire like the M4 or the M16 that the military uses. And they may have also three round burst, which is categorized as fully automatic. Those are also already illegal for civilians to own. So it would be more accurate to describe weapons of war to be limited to the M16 and the M4, and then to describe AR-15 style rifles as sporting rifles, correct? I, I would agree so. I mean, the, uh, let's just take another example, the Browning 1911. I mean, that was, uh, it's a handgun, a semi-automatic handgun that was developed by Browning, ostensibly for the military. Uh, 
it's, we, I don't think we would call it a weapon of war because it has a civilian use, but that's, that's maybe not an appropriate analogy because the, the analogy you're making here, or the, the distinction you're making is, one is a machine gun. You pull the trigger and it keeps going. As long as you grab that thing, it keeps going until it's empty. And the other requires you to activate the trigger each time, the civilian firearm. Thanks, Mr. Massey. Chairman Nadler, are you aware that a congressionally mandated study on the 1994 assault weapons ban found that in effect in reducing violent, uh, found it ineffective in reducing violent crime? As the, oh. and I quote, uh, Mr. Nadler, let me, if I can just get the quote out, as, and I'm quoting, as the banned guns were never used in more than a modest fraction of all gun murders, end quote, uh, before the ban. Are you aware of that, yes or no? Well, I, I, I have to say that I am aware of studies that show that uh, during the assault weapons ban, uh, mass shooting fatalities were 70 percent less likely to occur. Seven zero percent less. You were there were technical difficulties. It was breaking up a little bit, Mr. Nadler. But, um, the but what I said was that what I said, in case you didn't hear me, was that studies showed that during the period of the ban from 1994 to 2004, Mass shooting fatalities went down by 70%. Okay, well, I just read you a quote that says something different, that the banned guns were never used in more than a modest fraction of all gun murders. Would you, are you now saying that the study is inaccurate in some way, or are you just picking... Whatever, you're quoting, from, whatever you're quoting from is inaccurate because mass shooting fatalities went down by 70%. Well, I, I believe the study is accurate, and I'll get your staff a copy of the study and point you to the finding that it found that the banned guns were never used in a modest fraction of all gun murders. Mr. Nadler, are you aware that a follow-up to the study that I just referenced, uh, that study coming out in 2004, found the bans, and I quote, effects on gun violence are likely to be small at best and perhaps too small for reliable measurement, end quote. Yes or no? No. I, I, I just told you what, what, what I know to be the fact. Okay. I will get you the follow-up study, too, and point you in the direction uh, where it says, and I quote, the effects of gun violence are likely to be small at best and perhaps too small for reliable measure when we're talking about the... Well, if you want to have a battle of statistics, if you want to have a battle of statistics, our staffs can, uh, can, can talk to each other. Sounds good. I, I appreciate it. I look forward to getting you the study, uh, the study from 1994 and 2004. Are you aware, Mr. Nadler, that San Bernardino, Newtown, and Buffalo, Massachusetts shootings took place despite the fact that there was an existence of assault weapon bans in the respective states? Are you aware of that? That's an unfortunate occurrence, but uh, a, a, few, a, few, a few occasions does not prove the rule. So you acknowledge that in all three of these states there was already an assault weapons ban and shootings took place anyhow? Well, we never said that an assault weapon ban would solve every case, obviously. Yeah, I just want you to acknowledge that these weapons were already banned in those three states when the shootings took place. Yes, but we never said that, uh, uh, that, that an assault weapons ban would, uh, would, would, would solve every single case. You're citing three. Mr. Nadler, you were having a back and forth with Ranking Member Cole in which you said that in a matter of self-defense, an individual that was under threat and using self-defense could, could not respond with a, I believe you said, not a military weapon. Was that what you were saying? I don't want to misquote you here. No, but I didn't say that. That's not what I meant, sir. Okay, then, then I'll ask you. So Mr. Cole asked you if somebody is under attack, either by an intruder or some kind of dangerous animal, um, how do you think that person that's under attack can respond? And if they can respond in self-defense, what kind of weapons would be acceptable to you in that response? They should respond with any weapon they're legally permitted to use. Are you aware of how many times um, nationally there are defensive uses of weapons? We have had this discussion, these debates, and we've repeatedly cited... Um, would you agree that the CDC uh, found that annually there are roughly half a million to three million uses of defensive firearms? 
I wouldn't be surprised at all. Okay, and I should have said um, use of firearms in defense. There's a Georgetown study that also said it's 1.67 million. Uh, Mr. Nadler, are you aware? Our country is a washing guns, and that is the problem. Well, I think that goes to Mr. Massey's point that the problem that the the issue is that um, this bill seeks to limit the amount of firearms and the types of firearms, not to actually address the root cause of the problems. Mr. Massey, would you like to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a desire. There's, I think there's two desires here. One we share and one we don't. One, it, one desire we share is to reduce the amount of violence uh, that's committed by, you know, Americans against Americans. And the, uh, and the other desire, which I don't share, is just to reduce the number of guns, like just a indiscriminate reduction in the number of firearms. Uh, the problem with that is if that's your goal, to end, is if you feel like we're a washing guns, to, to quote the other witness, um, then the bias, I think, is just to think that if we just reduce the number of guns, that'll solve the problem. Let me give an, another example of how this isn't going to solve the problem. Um, in a previous hearing in front of this committee, uh, Columbine, the shooting at Columbine and the shooting at Virginia Tech were uh, offered as examples of where this 15-round magazine capacity ban would have stopped the shooting. The problem is, in both of those shootings, there wasn't a magazine that had more than 15 rounds. At uh, Columbine, they used 10-round magazines. At Virginia Tech, they were almost all 10-round magazines, and there were a few 15-round magazines. And because this bill is offered and, as, and promised that it will stop or reduce the violence that we all want to stop, and it bans a certain capacity of magazines, we know what's coming next because it won't stop. First of all, the promise is hollow. It's not going to stop that violence. Use 10-round magazines, 8-round magazines, 12-round magazines, and we'll be back here probably while we're all still in Congress even, and there'll be another bite at the apple, and they'll say, well, we've just got too many guns. We got to reduce the number of guns. We got to reduce the capacity of magazines, and there'll be another hollow, empty promise because people want something done. But I think people want more than do something. I think they want something that will work. Thanks, Mr. Massey. Chairman Nadler, are you aware of the common use standard that has been established by the Supreme Court? Yes. Are you aware that just last week a district judge in Colorado? issued a temporary restraining order against an assault weapons ban based on the common use test? Yes, yes one of your colleagues just said that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be aware of it. Yeah, I simply want to establish the fact that the common use test is being used by the court. Uh, would you also agree that there are... It's being used by one judge, whether it's being used by one judge whether that stands up on appeal. No. Yeah, one, one judge in the district court last week and also by the Supreme Court in at least three or four different Second Amendment cases since Heller. But, uh, but yes, the common use test. Uh, would you agree that there are 20 million AR-15 style rifles in the United States currently? I wouldn't be surprised. If you were to accept there are roughly 20 million AR-15 style rifles in the United States, would you not also have to admit that it seems that the AR-15 style rifle is in common use? Well, I would, I would have to admit that, and I would have to also admit that we have huge numbers of mass shootings in this country, unlike any other in the world. So, Mr. I Nadler, by, Mr. Nadler, so by your own admission, this bill is on its face unconstitutional. Because you've just admitted no, that AR-15 style rifles are in common use, and you've also acknowledged the common use standard. Come back, first of all, first of all, come back and read Heller. But second of all, remember that uh, this bill grandfathers all existing AR-15. Mr. Massey, would you like to talk about the common use standard and the fact that with you, when you have 20 million AR-15 style sporting rifles in the United States, that would clearly fall under the definition of common use, thereby making this bill unconstitutional? That is a test that's been um, applied. You know, at first they thought, well, maybe there, there was an argument that was made in Heller that um, the, the, the Second Amendment only covers firearms that were in use at the time of the, when the Constitution was written. But that's been clarified in multiple 
uh, hearings and Supreme Court decisions to say, no, what's in common use at the time? And um, there's, there's no other rifle that's more commonly purchased than the AR-15 right now in the United States. It's, it is like, it's at the top of, of every list. Mr. Nadler, uh, this bill allows for the temporary transfer of weapons at, and I quote, an established range. Would you like to elaborate on how an established range is actually defined in the bill? It's a federally licensed um, facility. Okay. Mr. Nadler, I, I'm sorry, I did, not, I did not hear. You said a federally licensed facility. Okay. Mr. Massey, um, with a definition like that, wouldn't this legislation effectively ban transfers between, let's say, a, a grandfather and a grandson at a range? Wouldn't it uh, ban the transfer of a weapon, let's say, to a friend, to an individual who is afraid of domestic violence? Uh, what is your thought on how this bill establishes, um, I'm sorry, defines yeah. established range? That's So that is a concern that we had during the markup. and. Uh, in fact, I offered an amendment to uh, say that if you transfer it to a victim of domestic violence, that that's not going to be outlawed, and that was shot down uh, by a recorded vote. So it's pretty clear that if you if you wanted to try and transfer this to somebody who was, let's say, a victim of domestic violence, that you would run afoul of this law, and probably infinite number of other situations we can't imagine. But I, I think you've hit on a few of them, like for hunting and transferring to a, a cousin while you're, you know, is, is your farmland an established range? I don't, I don't think it is under the definition of this bill. Right. Thank you, Mr. Massey. I, I, must, corre I, must, corre I must correct Mr. Massey. It has nothing to do with an established range. And a farmland is obviously not an established range under the definition of this bill. But if you'd read the bill, you'd find there is an express exception, an express exception for transfers from, uh, from uh, uh, between family members. Mr. Massey? I'm, I'm worried that, uh, well, you know, then that would exempt Kentucky because we're pretty much all related, I guess. But uh, to your point, though, it, does, it only covers- Not such it, extended families. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't cover, yes, I'm gonna offer that first uh, before somebody else does. But my point is it's just immediate family members. There's, you know, and we do have big families. Maybe that's where the uh, the myth came from. And you, you know, your second cousin might be like a brother to you, and because we um, we value family, and your second cousin's not covered here. Mr. Nadler, I want to go back to your um, back and forth with Ranking Member Cole. Um, he he asked you specifically if you wanted to ban handguns after giving you a statistic that said that handguns are used far more often in murders in the United States than sporting rifles or what you, you would describe as assault weapons. Would you like to clarify that? Do you, do you still believe that you don't want to ban handguns? Uh, no, except for the limitation that you can't purchase a handgun until you're 21. Okay, Mr. Nyler, do you, um, before you sign on to a bill to co-sponsor it, do you, um, I, I'm assuming you do your due diligence to make sure you actually agree with what's in the bill. Is that correct? Absolutely. Then are you aware that in 1993, you co-sponsored a bill to actually ban handguns? It's called the Health and Safety Act of 1993. Are you aware of that? Might very well have, I don't remember. Okay. It's 25. Place. So your position currently is different than your position in 93? Because you just told Mr. I Cole cannot, you didn't say, I cannot say I don't. I, I cannot say I don't remember anything about. Okay, I just find it interesting that in you co-sponsored a bill to ban handguns, and you just told the ranking member that you don't want to ban handguns. So uh, maybe you're moving to a center-right position uh, on this. I'm sure just, I never. I am not, I am not, I'm sure I never sponsored a bill to completely ban handguns. All right, thank you, Chairman Nadler. With that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. I, I know we're all. Going through statistics here, I'd just like to enter one for the record that uh, pointed out that 30% of shootings, um, of mass shootings, 
in recent history involved guns that were banned under the now expired 1994 federal assault weapons law. And I could go through every one of them here. I won't. I will ask that they uh, be put in the record. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Raskin. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. First, I just want to clear something up about um, the in common use at the time language, which comes from the United States versus Miller decision, which upheld um, Congress's uh, ban on sawed off shotguns. And the Supreme Court in 1939 said that the reason that it was upholding it was because that particular weapon had no reasonable relationship to a well regulated militia. Then Justice Scalia, um, in the District of Columbia versus Heller case, adopted that language. And Scalia, of course, is the great originalist of all time. So of course you would go back to the writing of the Second Amendment in 1791. And he said that he incorporated that vision of defending guns that were in common use at the time, which means muskets, not semi-automatic uh, assault weapons. But, but let me ask you, Mr. Massey, and I certainly wish that we could put your encyclopedic knowledge of firearms and your essentially sweet and kind disposition to work for making our country safer, because I think you could be of major assistance to us, but in uh, articulating the different factors at stake here, you seem to want to only act in defense of one of them. But I wanted to go back to your interesting colloquy with the ranking member um, about machine guns, and you explained very carefully uh, why machine guns could be banned and how that is in fact constitutional. So I just want to get you straight on this point. You believe that the federal ban on traffic and machine guns is constitutional. The, the ban exists and I follow the law. But, but well, no, but, but let's not be clever here. Do, it, do you accept that it's constitutional under the Second Amendment? Well, um, I, I actually believe if you went with the original reading of the Constitution, these laws should have been left up to the states. That, that it would be. So it could be banned by the states, you're saying? If, this is in an alternate interpretation. No, I'm just doesn't, asking doesn't you have simply. Basis in case law. But let me, <laughs> to your point, to your point, it's interesting you mentioned Miller. They, the, you know, the reason, the argument in Miller was that these weren't military style weapons, so they could be banned, implying that if the sawed off shotgun had been used by the military, that they couldn't have banned. But, you know, Justice Scalia says the reverse in the Heller case where he says, even if bans that could be used for military purposes could be banned, that's all right because of the originalist per principle. So we're right. So, so but wait, but if we want to, you can ban nuclear weapons, but you can't ban a musket because that's right. what was originally used. But if we want to rely on Miller, I'm just saying it's an interesting juxtaposition. All right. Well, look. The, the the fact is, I mean, I would love to tease you out on this. It seems like you concede the constitutionality of a whole set of bans on different kinds of arms. I mean, machine guns are banned. Sawed-off shotguns are banned. Bombs are banned, hand grenades are banned, nuclear weapons are banned, switchblades are banned. Um, do, I, I take it I'm not incorrect in saying that you accept the constitutionality of federal regulation of certain kinds of weapons. Yeah, absolutely, nuclear weapons, not switchblades. Okay, so, but some, you, you would agree, sawed off shotguns and machine guns, you've got no problem with that. You're not fighting that. Um, I'm, I don't understand why, I'll just, Technically, if you want me to engage you honestly. I, I definitely want you to engage me honestly, because I'm just well, trying to make a point here, which is- I don't is, understand why you can own a pistol that has a six inch barrel that will shoot a shotgun shell, but you can't own a shotgun that has a 14 inch barrel that will shoot a shotgun shell. No, there's, but, okay, there's so not logic I, Let's get at that, Let, let's get at that, because I think that what you've advanced today is a standard of exceptional and narrow technical proficiency in detail. But what if, in a social sense, we see that certain kinds of weapons are being marketed to certain kinds of uh, criminal forces or elements in the society? They're being marketed in a way that suddenly they gain huge popularity. People are taking them into kindergartens, nursery schools, supermarkets, churches, synagogues, mosques, and assassinating people. And so if we were to say, let us ban that form of weapon, the best we can are the sale of it, not the possession of it, by the way, we'll get into that, but 
the sale of it in order to save life. And then you say, well, wait, there's a weapon that hasn't been used for 50 years, which has more destructive power, or here's another one, which we think has more lethality, as you put it, but it's not being used. Why would that not be within the power of Congress as the representatives of the people to make that reasonable judgment that we can save life by banning it? Because, because you've already conceded that under the Second Amendment, we can ban certain categories of weapons. Well, we're talking in the context of the existing case law and the framework of the Supreme Court decisions. And, and I do believe that this bill has constitutional issues in light of Heller and the, and the recent, more recent Supreme Court decision and, and McDonald. Okay, just tell me, you said that, that, that you've been taking your kids hunting with the AR-15. Yes. What, do you, what do you hunt? Deer. Or, you hunt deer? Yes. Well, and this is, this is a simple question because the reportage that I saw out of Uvalde and other places was horrifying in that the effect of um, the AR-15 is such that they couldn't even identify the children. The parents had to come in and identify them by DNA. What is left of the deer after you hunt deer? with an AR-15? It, it depends on where you strike it. Sometimes there's a hole, sometimes there's a lot worse, but what my children have learned from that experience is the, the finality of taking a life and that it isn't pretty. It's not pretty when you shoot a deer. It's just not, and then they understand it's not a video game. And, I'm not, and by that, I'm not blaming video games in any way, but I will tell you this, that the the 223 round that's shot by the AR-15 is just barely sufficient for deer hunting. And that- Well, why does it have such an explosive effect on human flesh such that it essentially disintegrates the body as has been described to us in numerous years? Well, I mean, Joe Biden said that the nine millimeter blows the lungs out. Uh, look, it's, it has a lethal effect. We're not gonna, I won't uh, dispute that, but it has a much less lethal effect than a 30 out 6 or a 308. That's what has the, the, I mean, I know not a lot of people watch Rules Committee, but they'll be watching the floor debate. And, and the common gun owner out there is worried when you show videos of a 223 going through ballistic gelatin and say, this is what a 223 round does, and that's why we need to ban the AR 15. And their whole gun cabinet has guns that all shoot more powerful cartridges than that. And they're thinking, wow, if that ballistic gel and that demonstration is the basis for that gun ban, I've got to worry. So can, and I don't know how to tell them, well, don't worry, because if that's the rationale, if the, if the lethality of the 223 is the rationale for this ban, then there, you can rationalize banning all deer rifles, every single deer rifle. But of course, our legislation allows for 2,000 different kinds of hunting and sporting firearms, which uh, the Congress would be judging, are not equally a threat to the school children of America, to shoppers in Buffalo, to churchgoers in South Carolina, and so on. So um, I, the, the only, you know, I think you've had a fair-minded articulation of your position today, and I think we've learned a lot from it. The one thing I take strong exception to is the totally hyperbolic rhetoric, which I'm afraid I've heard from other people on your side, that this is disarming the people of America or taking the firearms away. The vast majority of firearms, more than 99.9% .9 are left with people. This is an attempt to deal with one firearm, which has been used in the most horrific massacres of our people across the country. And even there, you're far better off attacking it as under-inclusive than over-inclusive because it doesn't take a single uh, assault weapon away from anybody. It says you can't sell them, sell them in the future, but the, the couple million people who own uh, AR-15s today are not divested of them in any way. And I think we got to be honest with people about that so not to promote hysteria in the country about it. It doesn't take a single person's firearms away. This is not about possession. It's about, uh, it's about sale. Um, in, in the future. And so I, I... If I may? Yeah, please. That's, that's the concern that in one generation, all of these will be gone. And that the firearm that my son okay, used... Okay, let me ask, here, I, I disagree with you, but let's say that's he true. He can't own it. Let, let's say that's true. Let's say that were to save the lives of 20 school children at a kindergarten in your district. Would it be worth it? 
it's not going to no no but let's just a uh, hypo the just don't fight shotgun. the hypothetical as we say in law school don't fight the hypothetical I, I agree you view the possible hypothetical no no but wait a second mr massey <coughs> i understand you believe that there's a civil liberty to own if not every kind of weapon the vast majority of weapons although you've conceded certain categories can be banned but i'm putting but you're aside saying, my ideology you, but you're saying in defense of liberty, you're saying in defense of liberty, we have to be willing to sacrifice the people who are going to be killed. And we know that there will be another massacre because we have, uh, we have hundreds of, ma of mass shootings every year, right? So would it be worth it to save all those people's liberty to use that particular weapon if we knew that a class of kindergartners was going to be um, assassinated in your district or someone else's district. Putting aside my ideology and, and, you know, respect for liberty, I know that these shooters could do more damage with a shotgun and buckshot than they can with an AR-15. And because I have that technical knowledge, and I hope this isn't widely watched, or I wouldn't say that here, I mean, they use shotguns to blow doorknobs off. The carnage from a shotgun with buckshot is far worse than anything you're going to see with an AR-15. Okay. And that's why I can't engage in, the, in believing that if we banned an AR-15, it would save 20 lives. Fair enough. Mr. Chairman, I yield back to Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to um, say that I really appreciate I sat through Judiciary Committee with Mr. Massey. 14 hours. Yeah. <laughs> really that long? You had to tell me. Um, but I, I think it's very important that we use this knowledge and, and because I think he's pointing out some serious issues with, with the legislation. And I think it's very important that we be precise because, we oh, first of all, we owe it to the American people to make this clear so that they can understand what's going on. Um, but I, I find it unfortunate that he can point, and it happened in committee too, that you were pointing out issues and it, they just ignored it. Just, I mean, I, I, as I recall, you pointed it out, and they went on to some other topic, um, just completely ignoring what you, a very valid point that you pointed out. Um, and, and I know that you did already mention some, I think, in response to Dr. Uh, Burgess's questions about some of the inaccuracies in the bill, and you've been talking a little bit about them, so I won't go in, into detail on that. But I do want to uh, just, um, you also mentioned in committee, um, that there's some carve-outs for Department of Education and Department of Agriculture, and I know you raised it uh, during committee. So did you ever get a good reason why those were there and if they were going to, you know, why are there no other carve-outs? No, and I, and I appreciate this committee has not used the term weapons of war yet, as far as I can tell. <laughs> but that was used a lot in Judiciary Committee, and I anticipate it will be used in the floor debate. And it's... Uh, it's just not appropriate. And one way to demonstrate this is that the bill exempts every, I think there are like 80 federal agencies. Every federal agency is exempt from possessing these weapons. And so it, I offered an amendment in judiciary that would have taken the Department of Education and the USDA out of the list of uh, agencies that were exempted from owning what those in that committee were calling weapons of war, and I appreciate you haven't called them th that here today, and, and asked them to make the argument, and I will ask that if this rule passes and we debate this on the floor, for them to tell us why these are characterized as weapons of war and why the Department of Education or the USDA would need that for their mission. Who are, with whom are they going to war? And, and I appreciate that we have no reason why those two are allowed these weapons of war, as, we, as they were called in committee. There, there were some good faith uh, efforts to describe why these firearms might be needed by the Department of Education and the USDA from the other side of the aisle. But all of those boiled down to sort of defensive arguments, not offenses of where you're going to wage war, but where you might need to protect something or somebody and which seemed to make the argument for why the American people might need these weapons if they are useful in defending people and, and materials. And, and I do appreciate your expertise also, but I'm going to move on to uh, Chairman Nadler. And um, Chairman Nadler and the Judiciary Committee, and I know that Mr. Massey will remember this, I offered an amendment that would remove the ban on stabilizing braces in the bill. Um, and during committee, um, one of, the, one of the members of the committee said that the ban on stabilizing braces was included because the stabilizing braces could function as a bump stock 
and increase the rate of fire of certain weapons. Uh, you and your colleagues uh, have had some time to look into this, and I, um, do you still believe that those stabilizing braces would function as, bu as bump stocks? Yes, they would. And, and I want to read you a little bit. Gonna, uh, and we're not going to create another loophole in the bill. I'm sorry, say that again. We're not going to create another uh, uh, another loophole in the bill. Well, stabilizing braces, um, and, and I, I wish I had brought my uh, picture along with again today, but, uh, you know, these the braces are often used by hunters with disabilities, and I mentioned this in committee, and including disabled veterans who served uh, our country selflessly and uh, these disabled hunters use these braces uh, to help them safely hunt with pistols, and this accessory, um, this unnecessary ban on stabilizing braces disrespects those disabled hunters and sports shooting community throughout the country. Um, adding the accessory to an otherwise lawful pistol does not make the firearm more deadly, and so it's disappointing that uh, we would um, we would create a more difficult time for disabled hunters to take part in uh, in that, but. I just wanted to, um, you know, since you do still believe that they function as bump stocks, uh, you know, in the rule, the ATF said um, in recent Fish years... Box, I just want to say that I, I, a manager's amendment will address the last concern you voiced. It's, I'm sorry, say that again, please. Manager's amendment will address the last concern you voiced. So it, could... So we're not going to go maybe, further and create a loophole. Well, maybe, Mr. Nadler, uh, Chairman Nadler, you could explain to me a little bit about that because my understanding of the um, of the manager's amendment is it doesn't address it, address it directly, and it does make it uh, a little more. There's there's very vague language in the manager's amendment, and there's a um, some very difficult uh, uh, issues that have to be dealt with for the for the hunter. But maybe you can explain that a little bit to me. Um. We are addressing this through um, stabilizing braces that do not address firearms that are banned under the bill. And, and I'm sorry, I'm having such a hard time hearing you. Is everybody else? Because it's kind of cutting out. Could you repeat that? We are addressing stabilizing braces that are not used in uh, in firearms that are prohibited under the bill. And that's what uh, you have a picture of. So, it, so you are stabilizing braces, and I'm trying to understand, stabilizing braces um, would be allowed or would not be allowed, or um, I, I understand that there's... Um, that um, would be a, the stabilizing braces would be allowed on unprohibited weapons. But it, it looks like you're just uh, codifying the ATF rule and um, and the the rule that I see that you've got or that that you're codifying is um, in recent uh, and, and under their rule, in the rule, the ATF said, in recent years, some manufacturers have produced and sold devices, stabilizing braces, uh, designed to be attached to large or heavy pistols and that are marketed to help shoot, a shooter stabilize his or her arm to support single-handed firing. The ATF goes on to highlight the importance of these devices, saying the that's braces... That's exactly, excuse me, that's what's okay under the bill because it's a non-prohibited weapon. But nowhere in the rule, nowhere in We're the proposed rules... We're not trying to create a short-barreled shotgun, a short-barreled uh, pistol. But, but nowhere in the rule uh, about, you know, the proposed rules about stabilizing braces does the ATF mention anything about stabilizing braces impacting a weapon's rate of fire. Uh, Excuse nowhere me, I'm not concerned. I'm not concerned with what the ATF says in the rule. I'm concerned about... I've but been that's talking what about you're what's codifying, sir. No, it is not. We are... That's we are we are doing what I said we're doing. And, and I'm going to turn to Mr. Massey yeah. because he had a lot to say yeah. during committee, and I appreciate his expertise in this matter. Uh, I'm going to ask him if he's, if he, and, and I apologize, I'm just hearing about half of what Mr. Nadler says. And so, Mr. Massey, do you have something to add? Yeah, it is kind of hard to hear you, Mr. Nadler. Uh, but I think I get what you're saying. I see the manager's amendment, which we haven't had a lot of time to review, 
but it seems to try and clarify uh, a misconception that everybody on the Democrat side of the aisle had during the debate over this bill. They thought that a stabilizing brace was a bump stock, and they claimed seems uh, the chairman isn't willing to concede that it does not. <laughs> so uh, it does not facilitate rapid fire like a bump stock might. I do find it interesting that the manager's amendment might in fact countermand the new ATF rule. Uh, the manager's amendment says that basically you could have a stabilizing brace as long as it wasn't designed to be fired from the shoulder. Mr. Ma Mr. Massey, I'll bump stocks were designed to be, to be um, disability accommodating. And that's why we're being so careful so that the industry doesn't use, uh, doesn't use this to exploit another illegal um, loophole. Um, I think it, they're trying to contemplate something that doesn't exist maybe and in the process overly zealous band the stabilizing brace and it, it looks like they're no, walking it's certainly, I'll ch yield to the chairman. It will certainly happen because it's already happened. But the, I mean, I do, I will just say this, I do find a little bit of comfort in the manager's amendment that he says, as long as it's not designed to be fired from the shoulder, that it would be legal. And this is a distinction we've been seeking from the ATF, actually. So if the manager, if the chairman will provide this distinction that these stabilizing braces are in fact legal, that would mean a lot to millions, uh, there are probably 10 million, or maybe there are at least over a million of these stabilizing braces out there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's why we're clarifying it in the manager's amendment. Well, um, I don't really have anything to add other than it is not a bump stock. And um, this maybe this manager's amendment goes further than the manager wants it to because it looks like he's... Would the gentlelady yield for a second? Just to, I have a question up there, gentlemen. Mr. Perlmutter, So yeah. the stabilizing brace, that was what was used in the shooting in Boulder, Colorado, right, that killed 10 people. The guy used it just to, took one hand and was able to kill the 10. I'm not familiar with what was used there. Not, I, okay, I yield back. I'm not familiar. Um, but I guess I'm just, I'm kind of curious because I'm looking at this, that the, um, at the ATF, worksheet that um, that determines and and it is my understanding that the manager's amendment makes this the this worksheet what will be determines if a if a stabilizing brace is legal or not and there are things like if it has a strap or doesn't have a strap and and it's it's very confusing and vague and I so I don't know and how how it um, I think the only way to solve this is just to let the chairman tell us what the manager's amendment does. That's yeah. If you would tell us exactly what is legal and what isn't under the um, under the manager's amendment, that would be helpful. It's designed to accommodate a legitimate accommodation without opening a loophole, exactly in the way I said. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. It, it, <laughs> I don't, I don't hear it. He said it does what it says. It does what it says. Okay. So you won't explain it? I did I mean, explain it. It's about four times at this point. Well, it would be helpful. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I know that it's, that people are amused now at this point, but I, I sincerely would appreciate understanding better what would be legal and what would not be legal under the under the manager's men because well, this is a concern all I can say to people who I, use stabilizing braces. All I can say is since I've explained it four times, maybe it would be better if your staff talked to mine and they, they could go into it in greater detail. Mr. Chair, out of complete exasperation because I, I'm not getting an answer to my question, I yield back. Thank you very much. I just want to point out for the record that the manager's amendment was uh, made available on Tuesday it was on the rules committee uh, uh, on the uh, rules committee web page and um, and I think Ms. I think Ms. Nellis suggestion might be a good one right now that at this moment it might be preferable for your staff to reach out to his staff to see whether or not you can get some clarity to you. and mr. chair yeah. sincerely I I 
see that it, uh, the way that I read it, it, it sounds differently than what he's describing it. So I would, I mean, that's why I was trying to find no, clarification. I, I, no, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. And, and it's frustrating Appreciate where I get flippant answers back. Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. Over the past decade, gun manufacturers have reaped billions in profits as they've flooded our communities with assault-style weapons, inflicting death and horror on our schools, churches, grocery stores, malls, and even Independence Day parades. So it's about time that we reinstate the assault weapons ban. Our communities and our kids should not be held hostage to an extremist theory of the Second Amendment that is divorced from responsible gun ownership and defies the express purposes of the Constitution to promote the general uh, welfare to ensure the common defense and domestic tranquility. We've seen that doing nothing has allowed the murder of children, neighbors, teachers, doctors, and seniors, and it's become routine. Americans don't want to live in fear, and they shouldn't have to. Americans are demanding that Congress reinstate the assault weapon ban, and they shouldn't have to wait any longer. Now is the time to crack down on this flood of assault-style weapons that are endangering all of our communities. We all know that one bill won't stop every single instance of gun violence, but think of all the lives we can save with this bill. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, thank Chairman Nadler and Mr. Massey for coming uh, before the Rules Committee this afternoon. Gun violence has been said has truly become ep epidemic across America. It seems a week doesn't go by that we're not grieving a heartbreaking massacre like those in Buffalo, in Uvalde, in Tulsa, and in Highland Park. My own community of Rochester, New York, has had over 40 homicides so far this year on pace to break the record number set just last year. So nothing else we do matters very much if families don't have a basic sense of safety, if they can't go to the grocery store shopping, if they can't go to a movie, can't send their kids to school or attend a Fourth of July parade without fearing it might be the last thing they ever do. This is too important to not try to do everything we can to not pursue every legislative option available to us to prevent the slaughter that has become all too common. During the 10 years, and I think I'm repeating something you said earlier, Mr. Chairman, but bears repeating, during the 10 years Congress had a ban on assault weapons, the risk of a person in the U.S. dying in a mass shooting was lowered by 70%. Since the bans ended, however, mass shooting deaths are up over 300%. That's why I support strongly reinstating a ban, reinstating a ban on uh, assault weapons and look forward to voting for the bill on the floor later today. I have colleagues that I know want to work on this issue, but they're afraid of the power of the NRA and other groups like them. Uh, and the consequences they'll face if they step out of line. And we saw what happened with my friend, uh, former uh, fellow Republican colleague, uh, Congressman Chris Jacobs from my neighboring community of Buffalo, uh, when he dared to suggest that banning assault weapons um, was something he could support after one was used to open fire on his community, killing 10 people in the Topps market. 48 hours later, he was forced to abandon his run for reelection. It's the kind of chokehold that's keeping us at a standstill and preventing meaningful action that will save lives. So no law-abiding citizen should fear these reforms. Those who are beholden to groups like the NRA often parrot the argument that gun laws infringe on the rights of law-abiding citizens. But what about the right of everyone else to live free of violence? What about their right to safely put their children on a bus to go to a crowded festival or simply walk down the street without fear of being struck down by gunfire? Each of us took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and in doing so, to protect the American people from clear and present danger. So I'm pleased we're taking this critical step today uh, towards uh, those things that we were elected to do and doing our duty. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Desaigne. Uh Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because um, I, too, spent 14 hours in the Judiciary Committee on this issue, um, and I do plan to speak on the rule. But um, I just want to share this one thing from my district. Um, I'm from North Carolina. It's a purple state, very pro-Second Amendment. The folks I hear the most from on this issue are law enforcement. 
I have a great relationship with the chiefs of police in the 10 municipalities that I represent, and their number one issue is getting more guns off the street, in particular assault-style assault uh, weapons. And I just, you know, we haven't talked about that, but um, my law enforcement community wants me to vote for this bill. I support the rule and the underlying bill. Thank you, and I yield thank, back. Thank you very much, Mr. Nagoose. Uh, does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question? Seeing none, I want to thank our witnesses for, uh, for their testimony. Uh, please leave with our stenographer. Or is, oh, oh, Mr. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Um, I, I would just, thank you, I appreciate it. I'd like to just ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, the three studies that I referenced during my with, exchange. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, and uh, please leave with our stenographer or submit electronically anything uh, that you'd like to insert in the record. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Nadler. I want to thank Mr. Massey uh, for being here. Um, and I hope we won't see you again today. Um, but uh, but I, I, you are now free to go. That's more about how much we've seen one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are there any other members who wish to testify on H.R. 1808? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on H.R. 1808. Okay, the, uh, at this time, the Chair will entertain a motion from the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the people of Aurora, Colorado, of Boulder, Colorado, of Littleton, Colorado, I move the committee report a closed rule for consideration of H.R. 1808, the Assault Weapons Ban of 2022. The rule provides one hour of general debate on the bill equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 117-60 modified by the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. And finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit. You've heard the motion from the gentleman from Colorado. Is there any amendment or discussion, Mr. Cole? Thank you very much. Uh, just have one amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Massey asked for an open rule. Uh, I think, quite honestly, while he disagrees with the thrust of the legislation, he's probably more knowledgeable than most members of Congress on the issue, as my good friend from Maryland suggested. And I think he would probably have uh, some interesting ideas that uh, uh, you know could be taken into account. And the majority still have the votes to make a decision whether they thought they were uh, wise or not. But uh, I do think uh, uh, there are a lot of people in this body with all due respect, they probably know more about this, certainly than I do, but I think that many members who wrote the legislation do, and we ought to have the benefit of their participation uh, in the debate. So with that, I would urge an open rule, Mr. Chairman. You heard the amendment from the gentleman from Oklahoma. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Aye. No. Be the chair the noes have it. Aye. Recorded vote has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Desaigne? No. Mr. Desaigne? No. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Ross? No. Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Rushenthaler? I can ask a question. Aye. Um, Mrs. Fishbach? Yes. Mrs. Fishbach? Yeah. Aye. So, so no argument. No. Mr. Chairman? No. Can I ask uh, how Mrs. Torres is recorded? Mrs. Torres is not recorded. Mr. Chairman? Yes. How, how do you show uh, Torres? Uh, she's not You're not recorded yet. Yeah. Did you say it's a yes or no? You're, yeah. You're not recorded as no yet. Tor <laughs> Torres, I. <laughs> no. You want to be a no? This, this is an amendment. I don't know. Come on, guys. Come on. Mr. Chairman? Y yes. Torres is a no. No, okay. All right. Cl cl all right. Cl 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 clerk will re report the total. 
Four yeas, eight nays. The members not agreed to further amendments. Seeing none, the vote is now on the motion of the gentleman of Colorado. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. Pay you the chair, the ayes have it. Recorded vote has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Mr. Desaunier. Aye. Mr. Desaunier, aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Mr. Naguz. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. Mr. Fishbach, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Naguz, Naguz votes aye. And how is Mr. Naguz voted, recorded? Mr. Naguz is not recorded. Naguz votes aye. Mr. Naguz, aye. All right. Um, uh, I currently, uh, can you clerk report the total? Nine yeas, four nays. And the motion is agreed to, and I will carry it for uh, the Democrats. I'm, I'm so lucky. Uh, uh, 15 minutes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we'll probably be ready in 15 minutes. Okay. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just an invitation, especially to my hallmate, uh, Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Fishbach. Uh, we've got a ton of cake in my office that the uh, hall has paid for with those crazy Christmas decorations. So the second floor of Longworth has Christmas decorations back up as kind of a way to say goodbye to me. It's Christmas in July, and, and we've, got, we've got a ton of cake, and everybody, staff members are welcome, but particularly my hallmates. How do you take it that people on your floor are celebrating your departure? I, <laughs> I, I, I thought we were going to wait until he's actually gone. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a rolling party for months. I thank, it, I thank everybody. Without objections, the committee is adjourned.